Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, this is a great kickoff with the short courses uh, to our uh, KISS Biodiversity Workshop. So the first speaker today is uh, Dr. Janine cavender Barris. She is a professor in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior at the University of Minnesota. Her lab is focused, amongst many things, on physiological and e evolutionary ecology of plants, remote sensing of plant diversity and function, and ecosystem services of trees. Her talk today is focused on biodiversity science, and please join me to welcome Dr. Professor Janine cavender Barris. Thank you, Erica, and thanks all of you for coming to this meeting. So I'm gonna try to cover an entire career or semester's worth of knowledge about biodiversity and um, I have to be very selective in what I show and some of it you know like the back of your hand and some of it will go over your head and we'll just deal with all that in the questions. So what I'm going to try to cover is first which I think is most important is why should we monitor biodiversity period? Why are we here talking about this in the first place? And then origins of biodiversity. So here is some evolutionary background for those of you who think about remote sensing most of the time. And then explaining the spatial patterns of biodiversity that have long been recognized, metrics of biodiversity, the consequences of biodiversity for ecosystem function, and then towards a global biodiversity monitoring. So in my view, and the reason I'm in this, and the top has been cut off, is that I feel monitoring biodiversity is, is critical to being able to manage planet Earth in this time of rapid change. We need to be able to monitor in order to manage. And that's a lesson that people and social scientists have known for a long time. We are <clears throat> experiencing a biodiversity crisis right now. We're witness to the greatest loss of biodiversity since the meteor hit and the dinosaurs perished. Um, so <clears throat> in the Holocene, the last <clears throat> period of time um, and the whole time that humans have been on planet Earth, the climate was in some sense relatively um, <clears throat> wandering around a mean that we are now departing from and the future of climate looks very, very different. So we're looking at a very different future than our past. And if you're from California, you are daily experiencing uh, the increasing fires that are going on. If you're in the Midwest, like me, you might be appalled at the number of dying trees that you see all around you. It is unbelievable the number of disease threats that are hitting in the Midwestern part of the United States and spreading throughout North America. Oak wilt, something we've been studying uh, very intensively lately, the emerald ash borer, the woolly adelgid, Dutch elm, and, and this is just in North America. So disease threats are increasing. Now I've been part of the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services for the last three years. This is the America's Regional Assessment. This is a summary for policymakers, finally out. And despite those threats I just explained to you, the number one driver of biodiversity loss is land use change due to agriculture and forestry. So it's still land use is the primary reason we are losing biodiversity. But going forward, you see the importance of climate change and fragmentation, encroachment, and so forth in the future. And as a team of us in this Yetzidal paper established, there's a big data, data gap between the data that are being monitored and the, the, the species that are being monitored and those that we estimate to actually be on planet Earth. Biodiversity is being digitized rapidly. That is a fantastic phenomenon going on. But still, many species remained unmeasured in terms of their function and unmonitored. We may know they exist, but we don't know much about them. In fact, we know a lot about a small number of species and very little about most of them. The other thing to keep in mind is that biodiversity tends to be highest in the wealthiest, in the, in the least wealthy regions, in the poorest regions of the world where human needs are not met. And this sets up contradictory, conflicting goals because when people need to have their 
their needs met, they're not thinking about biodiversity as their top priority. And so if we <coughs> consider that there are direct trade-offs in biodiversity and how land is apportioned for maintaining, sustaining biodiversity versus for food production, there are these real biophysical constraints. Land can be used for sustaining maximum biodiversity or maintaining maximum food production, but the combination of maximizing those two things to meet human needs and sustain biodiversity is what we might term this efficiency frontier, and to use an economic term. It's a trade-off. There's actually math underlying this, and it's also an empirical relationship. What we can do as scientists, biodiversity scientists, remote sensing scientists, is establish what those biophysical constraints are, figure out what that efficiency frontier looks like. So we know that up in, in Minnesota, where I am, um, the US Midwest, we have a very different level of maximum biodiversity that can be attained compared to Amazonia. Although the agricultural productivity that could be attained is, much, is, is potentially similar. So the biophysical constraints in these two systems are very different. We go to Tanzania, for example. Tanzania can support really high biodiversity, but because of the topography, it can never support as much agricultural productivity. They try to grow corn in these montane regions, and it just doesn't work out that well. And so the biophysical constraints limit the combination of biodiversity and food production that's possible to sustain. That's where, that's where we come in, is figuring out what those biophysical limits are. Where people come in is they have values that differ. And so these are isolines of utility. So a darker line is an increasing utility. And this represents how we're willing to trade off biodiversity to get more food. And we can overlay these curves, the human preferences on the biophysical constraints, to get at what we actually want. This is what's possible. This is what's sustainable. This is what we want if we overlay those two curves. We can't get anything out here because it's not possible. But different stakeholders have different utility curves. They have different preferences. And so if you're a farmer, you really want to maximize agricultural productivity, and you want to be out here somewhere. But maybe if you're an environmentalist, you want to maximize biodiversity, but you still have to eat. So maybe you're over here somewhere. And so this is where politics, this is where social dynamics, this is where power comes into play. But where science can play a role is helping us figure out where that curve is and whether we're under it. And when we've looked at this intensively, we find that most systems are well under this efficiency frontier. So we can at least contribute to those uh, to conversations to decision makers by figuring out where we are and where we could be. And then power, politics, social issues take over from there. Another reason I feel the work we're doing is so important is, so this is, this is a draft graph from the IPBES assessment. And we were tasked with taking units of analyses, which are really just biomes, across the Americas and trying to understand how the habitat amount has changed, whether it's degraded, what's happened to native species diversity, threatened species, invasive species. And we did not have the data to do that. We went around and held expert meetings where we had people weigh in and tell us all of these things for every biome in North America, Mesoamerica, South America, and the Caribbean. We had to put these tables together based on expert opinion. There ought to be a way to develop data streams that fill in these values with real data. And similarly, this is in the summary for policymakers. We were charged with trying to understand the trends for all of the units of analysis, all of the biomes, and how they contribute, contribute to nature's contributions, how much they contribute, and whether, how they're changing over time. Again, that was all based on expert opinion. We ought to be able to have real data to fill that in so that we can feed to policymakers information that we know is reliable. So this is, this is based on that Yetzidal uh, paper. One thing that was promoted from that was a satellite mission for continuous global detection of changes in the functions and functional diversity of plants and their ecosystem consequences, not just plants, all of biodiversity. And, and Dave Schimmel will talk more about that. From that series of meetings, we came up with this idea of a global biodiversity observation 
observatory that would integrate remotely sensed data and on the ground phylogenetic functional trait measurements and species distribution models that Rob will talk about. I'm going to get into this a little bit now. But first, let me give us all a definition of biodiversity so we start on the same page. So it was co coined in 1988 by E.O. Wilson. It's the variability among living organisms from all sources, including diversity within species, between species, and of ecosystems. And to pull a quote from the IPBES assessment, it's the living fabric of our planet, the source of our present and our future. Let's go back to where biodiversity comes from and the origins of biodiversity on planet Earth. So this has time and millions of years on the x-axis, and you can see color-coded the major lineages of life on Earth. And if you look closely, you see all the speciation events, or some representation of them, coming out as little branches. And the branches that don't go anywhere are the extinctions. And you see some lines in here with lots of extinctions, like when the meteor hit and the, di and the dinosaurs perished 65 million years ago. So this represents speciation and extinction, shows the diversification of the major lineages on Earth, and it's, and it's in terms of time. So this is a phylogeny. This is one representation of a phylogeny, and it can be time calibrated with fossil data. We can look at biodiversity through time in another way. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, um, a graph showing the number of families of <clears throat> species in over time, and um, what you see are these moments where there have been mass extinctions. And so there have been five mass extinctions, and we are now in what many people have called the sixth mass, ex mass extinction, given the rate of biodiversity loss that's going on right now. So further on this theme of, going, of thinking about biodiversity in terms of time, it's worth recalling that the Earth did not always look like it does now. If we go way back in time, 300 million years ago, the biota, the life on Earth, looked quite a bit different in the deep past. If we move a little bit closer, let's say to <clears throat> that point 65 million years ago, the KT boundary, we have some sense of what CO2 looked like and what temperature looked like and how it was both were declining during that period. So the Earth was changing uh, its atmospheric composition and its temperature, and that led to expansion of new biomes. So starting out, the lowland tropical forest expanded and has persisted. Its, pe its peak uh, expansion was <clears throat> probably starting 90 million years ago to 65 million years ago. And then tropical dry forests. It became more seasonal as the earth cooled and dried. And then temperate forests are more recent. And deserts are actually have not been around that many millions of years. Savannah and grassland, potentially <coughs> only four to 10 million years. And Mediterranean, perhaps only five million years. And the tundra is the most recent biome. So as the earth has changed, so has biodiversity on planet earth. And the origins of species, where they evolved, and the context in which they evolved, leaves legacies for the functions that they have evolved that remain and that are carried to the present time. So species that have different biogeographic origins, even if they occur in the same place today, may have very different functions because of their past. OK, here's my one slide on how to build a phylogeny or what a phylogeny means. And it's a cartoon. You could do a whole course on this, and I'm sure some people in this audience teach those. But I want to make a point, and that is that life is organized hierarchically because of the way, <coughs> because of shared ancestry and the way that the information coded in DNA is passed down <coughs> as species diversify, as life diversifies. So um, this is what we would call a phylogeny. Here you see individuals. Individuals are nested within populations. Populations are nested within species. Those are nested within clades or lineages. And then we have higher order clades. So this is the hierarchical organization of life. And the genetic code <coughs> that our early ancestors had gets passed down, and some of it 
is shared in descendants. And so these colors represent different genes that code for particular traits, perhaps. And let's say all of these individuals share through ancestry one trait, but only this lineage shares those traits. Maybe mutation arrived here, or maybe it <coughs> was lost here, but in any case, only this lineage now has that trait. Whereas this, only this lineage now has that trait through ancestry. This purple trait here was again <coughs> arrived at through ancestry, but it reappeared over here through mutation. And so we get something that looks like convergence, perhaps. And here, a novel mutation that led to a new trait here. So this is something like how innovation of the tree of life works. <clears throat> and we can place phylogenetic information in relation to trait values. Take any functional trait, any attribute of an organism, species, on the x-axis here. The y-axis represents time, if we, if we time calibrate the phylogenetic information. And the tips are species in this case. And when you see here the trait values of distantly related species are very similar, that indicates convergence. And that's quite common in the tree of life. On the other hand, when trait values are quite distinct, that indicates conservatism. And we can calculate that. There are a series of measures for looking at how conserved and how convergent functional traits are on the tree of life. Okay, here goes two whole courses in evolution in one slide. And all I'm going to say is that microevolution has its own body of theory and is looking at within species dynamics. And macroevolution is really looking at the diversification speciation processes. I'll just remind you that the forces of evolution include mutation, gene flow, so the way that genes move between individuals in populations and between populations, genetic drift, which I'm not going to dwell on, and natural selection. So that's Darwinian evolution. And so when we're talking about below the species, we're talking about microevolution. When we're talking about species splitting and speciation, we're talking about macroevolution. And all these kinds of things become important in macroevolution are the focus of macroevolution, whereas these things are important in microevolution. And often micro and macroevolutionary biologists don't even talk to each other because their disciplines are so distinct in terms of the body of theory that they have developed from. I'm going to now give you a couple of models of evolution, of trait evolution. And, <clears throat> and so there are many models of how traits can evolve um, <clears throat> on a phylogeny. And the x-axis in all these cases is time. And this one is showing a Brownian motion model where traits are just randomly taking a random walk through time. And over time, their trait values diverge. And the more time that goes by, the more divergent they get and the more, the more variance there will be in trait values as species um, take a random walk through time and split into new species. Here is a bounded model of Brownian motion evolution. So there are just certain biophysical limits that prevent trait values from going beyond a certain value. And when it hit those limits, they, they random walk back again. And so the variance is bounded. Or other models that <clears throat> take selection into account and species, when they split, start evolving towards different optima that are most suitable for each of those species with their wandering trait values. So that's, uh, you could do a whole course on that, and we're just going to, that's just to let you know that you can model trait evolution. And we've used, um, we've thought about how we can take the hierarchical organization of life, different models of evolution, and actually think about how high dimensional data like spectral information um, should vary through the tree of life. And so we took common garden experiments where we have populations growing in common environments factoring out the environmental variation and species level and clade level differences. We looked at um, <clears throat> spectra in all of those species and found that we can significantly differentiate populations from each other with spectra and species and clades, but as we get 
higher up or have more expanded lineages, higher order clades, we predict, we can differentiate those higher order clades better than we can populations and even better than species. And that's something to think about. Everybody wants to be able to differentiate species, but what if we can differentiate higher order lineages? That seems valuable too. Okay, now here's just a reminder that genotype and phenotype are different. So, and I bring this up because some of the most intelligent engineers I know who think about remote sensing have asked me, do you think we could use spectroscopy, get it so good that we don't need DNA anymore? And well, no. <laughs> Genotype and phenotype are different. And um, the guy in the airplane next to me last night was an engineer. And he, he, he never heard of biodiversity. And so I was trying to explain what, the, what a genetic code is. And it's really like, you know, your programs that you write and all those scripts, that's the genotype of an organism. The phenotype are the expression of the scripts that actually get run in a particular scale, cell. All of your cells have the same genetic code, but only some of the scripts are getting run. That's why you have skin cells and muscle cells. And when a, the genetic code is placed in different environments, some get, scripts get run much more than others. And as a consequence, we get phenotypic variation or plasticity. So in a sun, she a sun leaf and a shade leaf, we get different layers. We get different numbers of cell layers. And the optics of those leaves change as well. OK, we're now moving to spatial patterns of biodiversity. This is global terrestrial vertebrate biodiversity showing higher diversity in the tropics at low latitudes than in higher latitudes. We see that in many, many different kinds of um, <clears throat> lineages, including angiosperm plant families, which have higher diversity at the tropics than in the temperate zone. There are many hypotheses for this. One of them has to do with, well, it's a better environment in the tropics. It's warmer and there's more water. And models that integrate climate can predict angiosperm family richness pretty well. Now Humboldt was already thinking about this back in the day, and um, he thought about the importance of abiotic factors at high latitudes and high altitudes in limiting species, and the more important role of biotic factors and all these organisms interacting with each other at low latitudes. So rainfall is an important stress gradient that limits biodiversity. We have fewer species in dry places than wet places. But habitat heterogeneity, which you can see in this <coughs> remotely sensed data, is also highly correlated with diversity. And that's because there are more avail available niches when there's more habitat heterogeneity, more different ways an organism can exist. And so sp species will diversify into different habitats. And as a consequence, here we see more butterfly diversity when there is more habitat heterogeneity. And a major, major prediction of diversity is area. So scientists were long noting that on islands of different sizes, there were different numbers of species in a particular guild. Many, many biologists noted this. And so that led to the very, um, this well-known calcul calculation of the species area curve, which is the basis for a lot of conservation work thinking about area and diversity. The more area you have, the more species accumulate. And if you take the log of both axes, you get a very nice predictive equation there. Now Whitaker reminded us that, OK, you can have diversity that you measure in a whole landscape. And then you have diversity that you measure in individual communities. And so he came up with the beta diversity concept, which tells us how many more species the landscape contains compared to an average subunit within the landscape. And so he defined that as beta equals gamma over alpha. Since then, the way we think about beta diversity has prolifer proliferated into myriad concepts, but that's the basic idea. So this is, for, again, from IP Best, from the America's Regional Assessment. For amphibians, birds, mammals, and plants, we show increasing diversity at tropical latitudes compared to temperate latitudes. 
And here are some of the hypotheses, and I'm just going to butcher this. I could teach a whole course on this. Um, but <clears throat> this is one of the most studied patterns in macroecology. And one hypothesis is that tropical environments, as I showed you, have simply been around a lot longer. And they covered a large area on planet Earth for so long that that's where species really evolved in <clears throat> since for 90 million years, species were evolving in tropical em environments. They had more area, and that is where species originated, our modern species. Um, <clears throat> But there's also an ecological hypothesis, is that tropical environments support more species. They have more solar energy, which leads to more metabolic energy, and that just simply supports more species. They also have greater stability. They don't have glaciers that are constantly disturbing them. They don't have the seasonal stress, at least the wet tropics. Then there are hypotheses about pathogen and pest pressure, which um, <coughs> are thought to be higher in the tropics. And there are a whole series of other hypotheses. But let's look at plant functional diversity. So plant functional diversity actually depends on which functional trait you look at. If you look at how <clears throat> the, the area of a leaf divided by its weight, that diversity is higher up in Canada than down in the tropics. Seed mass follows your typical pattern. Maximum plant height has a somewhat different pattern. If we were to take all the plant functional traits we could measure, then you'd see the same pattern of species diversity. But it's interesting to note that some traits really don't follow that pattern. And so here we go into a quick walk through functional traits in the leaf economic spectrum, because this really has become fundamental to how we think about axes of variation in plant life history. So that includes nitrogen on a mass basis, phosphorus, leaf mass per area, so the mass of a leaf divided by its area, or flip it over, take the, <coughs> the inverse, and it's the specific leaf area, SLA. The leaf lifespan, the amount of time a leaf spends on a plant be before it falls, and la light saturated net photosynthetic rates. There are other traits like height and seed mass and many, many other traits that physiologists work on that may be more important for how a plant actually fits into its local environment. But these are traits that s seem to fall in a correlated fashion to define axes of variation that, <coughs> that are linked to um, a slow, fast continuum. And so Peter Reich in 1997 showed across <coughs> seven biomes that net photosynthesis was highly correlated with nitrogen, that specific leaf area was highly correlated with photosynthesis, that leaf lifespan was highly correlated with specific leaf area, and there were all these intercorrelations among these traits. <clears throat> I actually found the same thing within um, particular lineage of species, and he got scientists together from around the world. We put our data together, and this became the leaf economic spectrum, which really does define a slow, fast continuum, a major axis of life history variation. So species will tend to have slow metabolic rates, slow turnover in their traits, and <clears throat> be able to tolerate stressful environments, low nutrient environments, or they will tend to have high metabolic rates, fast turnover, and they'll, be, they'll do well in competitive environments where there's, high, where there's um, high resource availability. Okay, but then what about Felsenstein? What about Joe? Um, he said you can't actually do that. You can't actually take those correlations and and be sure they're meaningful because species are non-independent. As, as I mentioned, they have shared ancestry. So a species is not a, independent from another species. And in fact, your correlations might actually just be two different families with one event that separated them. And in between, within those species, there's no correlation. Well, so that led to a whole era of studies trying to unpack that. He developed a method of independent contrasts. David Ackerley and Peter Reich then went back through that data and <clears throat> found, OK, some of those correlations don't hold up when you use phylogenetically independent contra contrast. But when you cover broad swaths of the tree of life, the plant tree of life, most of those relationships still hold. And here is a way of looking, that, looking at that. If these are all the trait relationship, if, if these are two traits and these are all the species showing that relationship, then you put a phylogeny on them. Within some of those lineages, there will not be any correlation. Others, there might be. And then 
Others might show convergent evolution where two distinct lineages have very similar function. So all of that can happen. Then Sandra Diaz and colleagues <coughs> more recently had this paper taking six traits <coughs> that include height and seed mass and stem density or wood density. And they found, astonishingly, that all of the trait variation in the plant tree of life can be really collapsed into two major axes. And you're really separated by woody species and non-woody species. You get some gymnosperms falling out and some ferns falling out. But for the most part, there are these major axes. This is the leaf economic spectrum here. And then there's some other axes that have to do with wood density and seed mass and so forth. And so there are real constraints and trade-offs in plant function that you can see here based on that uh, more recent analysis. OK. We're going to quickly go through metrics of biodiversity, just so that we're all on the same page when we talk about taxonomic diversity, which is species or family richness can include abundance, phylogenetic diversity, genetic diversity, functional diversity. Then there's spectral diversity, geodiversity. Um, when we think about alpha diversity, the main entities we're considering are the number of species, or if we're talking about pixels, it doesn't have to be species, abundance, evolved distances between species, maybe this is time or maybe it's a number of mutations, functional distance between species or pixels, so this could be Euclidean distances, it can be a multivariate measure, and dispersion in trait space, so how they're actually dispersed in trait space. Here is, so taxonomic diversity richness is just numbers of species, but then the abundance of species really matters. So here's Simpson's diversity index, and <clears throat> this is the equation for it. If you calculate that out, you see that in a community that has 50-50 of each species, it's half one and half, half the <clears throat> individuals are one species, the other half are the other, you end up with a diversity of about two. <laughs> but where most species are only most individuals are of one species, you get a diversity that's much lower. So abundance really matters. What about phylogenetic diversity? Well, Faith defined this as the sum of all the branch lengths in a phylogeny. That's the phylogenetic diversity. So that scales with species. You add more branches, so add another species, you get more distance. But that's Faith's diversity. I like this one from Matt Helmus. <coughs> which he has three metrics of diversity, and it penalizes species for being too closely related. So you get a maximum diversity, and it does not, this PSV, the spe phylogenetic species variability, does not scale with, with numbers of species. It, it maximum at one, when you have a star phylogeny, all the species are as independent as possible. But when they're not less independent, then the PSV goes down. Now, <clears throat> the species richness doesn't scales with numbers of individuals, but there's a penalty for being less independent, for species being more closely related. And so here you see higher values when you add another taxon in there. And then the PSE, the phylogenetic species evenness, can incorporate abundance. And so you, all these measures then give you a way to take um, the non-independence of species into account and the abundance of individuals of each species. And then Chow <coughs> came up with a very nice metric that um, goes further than that. And I'm not going to explain that one. <clears throat> so then when we get to functional diversity, we now see, oh, OK, there's this whole proliferation of methods. They, some of them look just at distance, like Faith's PD. And some of them look at some of the pairwise distances. Some of them are incorporating abundance. Some are then also incorporating <coughs> effective number of distinct species and so forth. Steiner came up with this metric where he emphasized the dispersion of species in trait space. And this includes multiple components, the magnitude of dispersion, the variability among distances, and the effective number of equally distant species. It can incorporate abundance, and it can be used for, for entities other than species. And let's just say there's a whole suite of methods for beta diversity, too. So we've been looking at diversity um, and how we can use spectral data to try to predict diversity and manipulated experiments at Cedar Creek where the numbers of species in plots on the ground have been manipulated for a long period of time. 
And can we use this high dimensional data and spectral information to predict the alpha diversity and, and consider beta diversity? And the idea is that the variation in the spectra is a consequence, Phil will talk all about this, is a consequence of the different anatomical, structural, and chemical attributes of different species. And that that should separate them out across the tree of life. And so John Gammon student, Ran Wang, <coughs> conducted these excellent measurements showing that yes, you actually, with the simple spectral diversity metric of coefficient of variation across pixels, you can predict the Simpson's index, but it really depends on spatial scale. And so the higher resolution the data, the better prediction you get. And then Anna Schweiger, the postdoc who's sitting here, then took spectral measurements of all these plant species and showed that their functional distance, <clears throat> the distance between pairs of species is highly correlated with their spectral distance. And their spectral distance is also highly correlated with their functional distance. And so now we have the spectral, we have a, a proliferating set of spectral diversity indices as well. And on that note, we're now going to move to consequences of biodiversity. And so here we can think of, about all the consequences of biodiversity. Many people have written reviews on this. There's a lot written, and, and I'm going to go very quickly through this. So ecosystem function, I'll talk a little bit about that. Stability and resistance to desert disturbance has been enhanced by more species. It has consequences for other trophic levels. And it has also been shown to be important for ecosystem services. So going back to this long-term experiment at Cedar Creek, each of these curves represents a different year. It's from early on, the, the cooler colors are 15 years later. And the productivity of the system is predicted by plant richness. And that slope of that relationship gets steeper through time. So it becomes stronger through time. We showed a while ago that six different metrics, phylogenetic diversity, functional diversity, and so forth, also predicted productivity in that same system. And now Anna has shown that spectral diversity, whether you measure it at the leaf level or whether you remotely sense it and pull out pixels and don't even have species involved in the measurement, you also predict productivity. Now, is this just grassland systems that, that biodiversity um, predicts ecosystem function? Well, so this is, <clears throat> this is a tree diversity experiment at Cedar Creek that's um, been in place for several years now. And the first papers coming out of that, it's Jake Grossman, show that the overyielding increases with species richness. So we're seeing the same kind of phenomenon. And then Liang et al. took inventory data around the globe and showed in general, relative species richness is associated with increasing productivity. Okay, then Helena Muller-Lando, um, sent me these slides from, these are the <coughs> forest geo plots all around the globe. And when they look at small grain sizes, so 0.04 hectares, they see nice relationships between species richness and productivity. But as soon as they move out to larger spatial scales, those relationships start to fall, fall apart. So here again is an open question of whether and to the extent to which this, these relationships hold in natural systems and at what spatial scale. Um, <clears throat> those forest geoplots also show that abundance fluctuations team, seem to be smaller at species-rich uh, plots and species-rich sites, which is consistent with the idea that there's more stability with more diversity. And maybe we can get Helena to talk more about all that. So I'll just finally mention that we've now been working in this um, <clears throat> Nimbus National Institute for Mathematical Biology and Synthesis Working Group to connect plant spectra to the tree of life with the idea that we'd really like to be able to take an unknown spectra and find out where it fits in the tree of life, constrain, and then use this for remote sensing, constrained by species distribution models, probabilities of where species should be or where species are predicted to be based on independent data. And that would require getting spectral, spectral sign signatures from, <coughs> for focusing on trees to start with, on trees. And where can you get that kind of geo-referenced, very specific information about tree identities? Well, botanical gardens are one place to start. Every single tree in the garden is geo-referenced and, and has <coughs> authoritative 
species name. They maintain about 17,000 of the 60,000 known tree species and include 240 out of the 267 total plant families with trees, so about 90% of the tree families. And then there's tree divnet, which is <coughs> recently expanded around the globe with diver tree diversity experiments like the one I showed you at Cedar Creek. All those tree species are known and are, uh, could be a source of information. And then, of course, the forest geoplots. And um, Helena sent me some slides about the work they're doing. This is a 50 hectare plot generated from <coughs> UAVs. And every, every canopy is digitized manually. And <coughs> each one corresponds to a tag tree in the field. So this just is food for thought. And I'm actually going to end here and looking forward to rich discussion about um, the Global Biodiversity Observatory and how we monitor biodiversity uh, remotely.